Hello, everyone, and welcome to the I'm Loving Me webinar series. I am just so excited that you guys are here, and I just cannot say how much I want to thank everyone for showing so much love on social media and being so supportive. Our campaign hasn't even launched yet, and we have so many people joining our social media pages, our Facebook, our Instagram. And tonight we have our first guest with us who I've met through a mutual friend. And we talked for maybe 10 or 15 minutes before we set up this interview. And I'm telling you guys, I was so blown away. Just her story alone about how she overcame all of the emotions and everything that she has been through and still going through it really is going to touch you and really just make you think about yourself and about your health and basically really get you into the mindset of always be sensitive as to what other people are going through because really you would never know okay so i really want you guys to listen i really want you guys to have some fun and after we do this interview i'm going to explain everything about the i'm loving me project but now, you guys, I want you to help me welcome Candace Brunson. Candace, thank you for joining us, and thank you for being our first guest. Oh, you are most welcome. And uh, you know Tasha is my cousin. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is my boo. You know, yes. sometimes you you be surprised um, what links that, you know, Tasha and I, we don't really see each other often, but uh, this link is just, it was meant to be, it was meant to happen. It was destined. You know, Tasha and I have never met, even not at a family reunion. We just know each other over Facebook. So I just find that to be um, just a fate situation, you know, destined and in the hands of God. But my story is um, I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer on the 18th of April, 2018. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lump in my breast last year in 2017. I went for my mammogram. I was 41, mm -hmm. actually 40. And, you know, the doctor was like, oh, it's just a deep tissue cyst. Don't worry about it. Um, we'll just keep an eye on it. So six months later, we did another MRI and it was June. Mammogram, nothing, no growth, nothing. I decided to switch jobs. I left my job in Alabama and I got a new job here in Texas where it's totally different. I'm a nurse by nature, but now I teach and do instructions with different people. So it's different allowances. So, you know, normally nursing is bedside. Yeah. So I got here in November of last year. So almost a year I've been here in Texas and probably January or February, the mass just started to grow and wow. it started to misshape in my breast and, and everything. So I finally got the scan done, the ultra, not the ultrasound, the mammogram done. And the radiologist came out and said, listen, if you were my wife, I would want you to do an ultrasound right now. Wow. Really? He said, yeah. So I said, okay. So I got it done. And they said, he said, it's a lump in there. And I said, yeah, I know. He said, no, 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 no. It's a lump in there that encompasses your entire breast. Jesus. So I'm like, what? He said, if you section your breast into four quadrants, you have lumps in every quadrant of those four sections. So I said, I said, okay, like I was nervous. He was like, so um, get your doctor uh, to get you a biopsy. Mm -hmm. So on April 16th, I went and got my biopsy done. Yeah. Two days later, my primary care called me and she said, you had um, stage three in situ mammary, mammary gland cancer with METs to your lymph nodes. And I was like, okay. Like, I'm just shaking my head, okay. Right. I was just nervous, I didn't cry because the next thing was, I've gotta tell my dad, I've wow. gotta tell my children, and I've gotta tell my sister, my sisters. So I'm like, how do I tell them? So in the process, I call one by one and I tell them, and they're all like, okay, so what are we gonna do? And that's what I needed to hear. Not, yeah. I'm sorry for you, or them start crying, nothing. What are we going to do? The game. It was like, the, let's go. We got let's, let's handle this. Let's do this. Okay. So I saw my oncologist. I met my surgeon first on May 1st. I met the oncologist May 2nd. And I started chemo 
uh, my first treatment on the 30th of May. So in between all of that, my daughter was graduating from high school. So I went to the graduation and I told my daughter after she graduated, she was like, oh, I'm not worried. She was like, you're just going to be a badass baldy. I was like, oh, <laughs> I, love she did. I was like, okay, all right. I said, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to look good. I'm going I'm to be good bald. I said, this is going to work. Right. Not knowing what kind of shape in my head, but she had me hyped. So I was right. ready for it. Right. Right. So chemo came and I saw my doctor that morning and she says, um, in between I had my port placed with my uncle, with my surgeon. So that was cool. It all worked out. And um, I had that done the day after I came back from her graduation. Okay. So my oncologist says to me, she was like, listen, your hair is going to fall out 14 days to the day after your second treatment. I said, really? She said, 14 days to the day. Okay. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, all right, cool. Well, 14 days to the day after my first treatment, my bad. So my first treatment was the 30th. So I'm thinking, I'm laying around, and I realize that my next treatment is coming up. My birthday is coming up now. I'm about to turn 42. Wow. On June, I want to say June 16th, I combed my hair, and the clumps just started coming out. Oh, my God. And I was like, okay. And more and more, and I, then I started to just see my scalp. And I'm thinking, okay, if I stop, if I comb, then it's going to get to a point where nothing else is going to come out because everything is still rooted. Right. Nope, still coming out, still coming out. So I, I laid on the floor, and I was like, Jesus, what am I going to do? My hair is falling mm -hmm. out. My hair is falling out. And I began to cry. Ooh. I cried for almost two hours non-stop. And, and that's the thing that I wanted to talk about is like when it, when, when it really hit you that this was real, what was that, what was that feeling? You, mm -hmm. uh, did you get nervous or did you just say, why me? Or, you know, what did you feel in that moment when you saw your hair coming out and you crying and, you know, what was that feeling like? The diagnosis in itself, I never really cried about the diagnosis because I felt like it wasn't for me. Like based upon my faith, yeah. I felt like this disease process is not for me. My father had prostate cancer and he's been in remission and everything. So it's not for me. Okay. It's for somebody else to move and change their life. That was my initial thought process with that. Mm -hmm. Because the whole point was, I don't know where anybody is with their faith or their religion, but at that point I knew I needed to turn over what I had to right. God because there was no need to have me and him both trying to fight this battle. Right. Somebody had to fall back. Right. And if, if I'm smart enough to know, I, I don't want him to fall back. I need to fall back. Right. So that's what I did. I fell back. Mm -hmm. And so, but that moment when my hair fell out is when my vanity went. Mm. It's like, I, I feel like I'm no longer beautiful because I don't have hair or I don't, I don't have enough hair that I can attach a track to. Right. Um, I went and bought a wig. Girl, I put on the wig and I was like, ew, this is ugly. Right. I'm used to wearing wigs. Uh -huh. But I felt like that wig was ugly. It was awful for me. And then I went, I just, I just went through the rest of the week and I was just sad because I had to put the scarf on and I started to have what I felt like was the cancer look. Wow. That when people look at me, they know that I'm sick. Yeah. You know what I mean? And everybody kept saying, no, you don't look sick. You don't look sick. I was like, yes, I do. Yes, I do. And then two days before my birthday, on June 21st, I woke up after my next cancer, my next chemo treatment and mm -hmm. said to myself, I got to take this hair off. Yes. And I called my children's father, who's, he shaves his head bald. I said, how do you shave your hair? What do you do? And he said, oh, I got clippers or whatnot. And I said, well, I don't have any. And he was like, well, you need a good pair of clippers. And I was like, well, how much do they cost? And he was like, I think he said maybe about... $45, $55 or something like that. And I was like, okay. He said, but you know what? Let me buy these clippers for you. And uh -huh. he put the money in my account. I was like, I can afford these clippers. Right, right, right. Let me do this for you. So yeah. I was like, okay. So I went and I got the clippers and he called me back. He said, I called him when I was in the store and we FaceTime to see which clippers to get. He said, call me when you get home. I said, okay. So I got home. He said, now let me talk you through this. Mm. 
and I just started shaving my head and then just watching the hair fall off. And as the hair was falling off, girl, I cannot tell you how free I felt. I felt like shaving my head was the only control that I had over this cancer. And I said, you know what? You may take my hair from me. You may take my eyebrows from me. You may take my breasts from me. But you know what? You're not going to take me. And yes. that's just how it went. And that's just how it went. And so from there, I just took every day with, you can take my weight, but you're not going to take my spirit. Yes. You can take, you can make me throw up every day, but you're not going to take my spirit. Mm-hmm. And that's just how it was. I just woke up every day by the grace of God, every day by the grace of God. And, and um, and so Candace, recently I just met... come from though, where does that come from? Because you know, most women, when they get a diagnosis like that, it is so scary because first you thinking like, well, you know, why, right? Why me? Why is this happening? And if you're not strong enough for a person like you, like, is it your faith? Is it you because of your experiences seeing the prostate cancer? Like, what was it that really made you decide to fight? Was it family? Because there's somebody out there who got a diagnosis today, right? Mm-hmm. And they don't know what the hell to do. They're on Google right now, looking at every article, WebMD, trying to figure out if that's really them, right? If those mm-hmm. symptoms are really them, or looking for another doctor to get a second opinion because they cannot accept the fact that that's them. You understand? I got you. It was it was my family. Mm-hmm. It was my family, and it was my choice. Mm. Um, it was my choice to not want to leave my family and fight. It was my choice to not want to leave my children, not want to leave my father, not want to leave my siblings and my nieces and nephews. It was my choice. Right. You know? And even though I know whether we, when we come and we go is not ordained by us. Yeah. But when you have that faith in God and when you know that he has set you on a path to do something that's meant for something, mm. you just, you just got to answer. You just got to answer. And I know, like, I feel like most of my life I've been running from him. And, you know, I, you know, my parents made sure I went to church a lot as a kid. Right. And then as I grew older, I strayed and stuff like that. But sometimes he will take you to a place where he will say, listen to my voice. Mm-hmm. And it's nobody else in the room. You know, Dr. Miles Monroe says sometimes God give you a challenge to put you back in the class that you missed. Come on now. (laughs) And I used to tell people all the time, like when something would happen, I was like, Lord, please let me learn this lesson because I can't go through this again. I can't go through this this again. And that's where I am. I'm like, okay, with this disease, let me learn what I need to learn because I don't want to go through this again. And let whoever needs to see me see you in me as number one because I was watching John Gray the other day and he mm-hmm. said like he was going through all these things and he said to God why me and right. God said to him if I made you perfect you wouldn't speak to me true indeed because you would make me think you would think that I was just using you because mm-hmm. you were perfect mm-hmm. but I need you broken in order for people to see you because that's when you give me my worship and praise when you're broken and, and so don't have me that's, on this, please. That's, that, I, I, seriously, and, and that's how I live. When people say, you don't even look like you sick. You don't? I say, that's nobody but God. It's not me. It's mm-hmm. not me. Mm-hmm. Because the medicines, you've seen other cancer patients. You look right. at them, you know they got cancer. Like, we all have, like, a signature look. No eyebrows, no hair, yeah. you know. But, you know, I refuse. I refuse. The moment I got sick, I said, Jesus, whatever it is that you need to take me through on this walk, be with me. And I promise you on the other side and door ring, I will give you nothing but glory. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Wow. Well, I know for sure that you sound like you're very strong and you're very passionate. And I know for sure that just by telling your story that you have helped just that person who has gotten that diagnosis some type of relief so um for those people who have or who's afraid to get checked out or 
who feels like this is something that they they cannot get through because some people don't have the support of their family. Some people probably don't have the insurance just to go through whatever the treatment that they have to go through. For that woman that's out there, what is your advice for her when she finds out that she has breast cancer and it's real? What are some of the things that you suggest that she should do in order for her to be able to at least get some kind of strength that you have just to go and endure the process? Well, the first thing is if you feel something or if you're old enough, whether you want to know the diagnosis or not, you need to go because the earlier you catch it, the less you got to go through. Yes. Some people catch it at stage one or stage two and don't have to go to chemo. They just get a mastectomy and they good. Wow. Some people like me are stage three and you got to go through chemo. Some people stage two may have to go through chemo. It just depends on what it is. But when you get that diagnosis, you got to take the bull by the horns. Mm. You got to take your life in your hands and say, okay, what do I need to do to get to the end? Mm. And the end is to start to be in remission. That's the end. Okay. So if that means you need to start eating healthy. So that way, because if you have to do chemo, you're not going to want to eat. So you're going to want your body as strong as possible from the get go. Mm -hmm. The second thing is as you go in through chemo, you want to look from the first session of chemo, immediately start looking at that sixth session of chemo. Cause normally you go to five to six sessions. You start looking at the end. Mm -hmm. because that's where you want to be. You want to be at the end. Right. After that, when you get to chemo, if you got to do radiation, you start looking at, I'm going to have new boobs. Yeah. Because what we fail to do is we fail to prep ourselves for after we've had the, the surgery, after cancer is over, when we're in remission, what do we do? That's good. That's good. You start, you start thinking like you just sitting there waiting for the other shoe to drop and it's not ready to drop. You just wasting time thinking that my back hurts. Oh my God, that's cancer in my back. My hip hurt. Oh my God, that's cancer in my, my hip. No, you, the end result is I'm not going to have cancer and I'm going to keep living. So let me get to work. And that's what you have to do. Prep your mindset always for forward and not now. Wow. Wow. Candace, I have to say, I, I just thank you first for being our first guest. And then two, you're so passionate about it. I know just hearing your story that you are going to help so many women just to go get checked out. Like I'm about to be 40, you know, and I have that 40 syndrome where I'm like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get myself in shape. I gotta do this. I gotta do that. You know, I, there's no more eating bad and all this stuff. <laughs> and, and you know, because it messes with you where you're like, well, I really got to focus on my health. I really got to focus on making sure that I start taking care of me. But when right. things come, you know, out, which they say it's, um, they call it surprises. You know, people like the surprises that they like. They don't like the surprises that just come out of nowhere, right? Right. That's but those are the surprises that always show up. You know, that those are called problems and people don't right. like that, you know? <laughs> but, you know, what, what they say is, is like, I just appreciate the fact that you just grab the bull by the horn and that you are doing everything that you can to stay positive and you have the support of your family. And I just appreciate you telling your story and, and being here. And like I told the audience, the, I Love and, the I'm Loving Me project is just this, is that we are connecting with women who have overcame their emotional, their spiritual, their, those things that, that are hard to deal with in their lives. All of the, all of the low self-esteem things that we tell ourselves, we are partnering up together with some amazing women to show you how you can get through that and how you can walk through that so you can start to live the life that you were supposed to live. That's why we always ask the question, what do you see when you look in the mirror? If it's something that you don't like, 
you got to change it. And it's funny you say what you see when you look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. If I could show you my bathroom mirror, at the very top of my bathroom mirror, it says, good morning, gorgeous. Oh, I write all wow. over my Wow, me too, says, me too. Good morning, gorgeous. Yes. You know, you know, because of you, Lord, I have amazing yep. grace. And yep. it says, you know, my family is my biggest support. Everything that I need to see, my favorite Bible verses, my children's name. Wow. So every time I go on my bathroom, I get renewed. Yep. And the new one that I put up there is you can't do this by yourself. It's okay to ask for help. Yes. And I read that every day because when I had the surgery, the mastectomy to re remove my breast, because what ended up happening was I had an MRI uh -huh. and they told me, they said all the tumors were gone. Yeah. I just had residual um you know, scar tissue from the tumors, but every tumor that I had in there was gone. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm just going to go in there and just take out the tissue. So when I get home, you know, I don't really want to look in the mirror because, you know, I'm like, but I've been prepping myself like, you know, all summer long, like holding my breast down yeah. to see what I look like without a breast, you know, getting my mind right. Like I said, always looking forward. Yes. When I looked in the mirror. I said, I don't look no different. Nope. I said, nobody has to know that I don't have a breast. Mm. I said, my hair is coming back. My mm. eyebrows are coming back. Oh, I'm still me. Yes. And even though I have one boob right now, I still love me. Yes. Woo. And that was, that was the moment. Girl, I started going out with no bra on. Wow. <laughs> I ain't care. Yes. Because it's not about what anybody thinks. It's about yes. how I feel about myself. Yes, ma'am. You know what they say, what you eat, don't make me crap. Yep. So I don't care what you think. You don't pay my bills. You don't make my food. You don't do none of that for me. So Nothing. I'm going to be me. Bald head, one breast, no bra, <laughs> no my thing. I know that's right. And Candace, I just want to thank you for this interview again. Um, and guys, if you can, you can actually follow our page on uh, Facebook. It's the I'm Loving Me Project. You can follow us on Instagram. We're going to have Candace interview up. And if you want to talk to Candace, she's in our group. If you have any questions or anything for her, or if you have any uh, challenges, or if, even if you went to go get tested and you don't know what to do next, uh, Candace, if it's okay, we can leave uh, your Facebook or anything where people could actually contact you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love I love sharing my story because you never know what somebody else is going through and conversation is the way to figure it out. And we all have to help each other. All of us sisters have to straighten each other's crowns and, and let us know we look good and keep it moving. I know that's right. Well, Candace, thank you so much again. And I just appreciate your, your wisdom. I appreciate your courage. I appreciate everything. And your story is so amazing. I'm just so excited to share with everyone so i thank you thank you so much and thank you i thank for being you our first guest <laughs> you're <laughs> welcome series. so all right guys i just want to say um thank you again look out for the video and i will talk to you guys soon and give you information on the next video when it comes available see ya bye